Good morning, everybody. I'm Greg Demetrio, the CEO of Lorraine Gregory Communications, and this is Ask a CEO. It's a show that tries to get us inside the C-suite and understand what executives go through in their day-to-day -day operation of their businesses. So we have a very special guest today, uh, Dr. Nick Fitterman, who is the executive director of Huntington Hospital, uh, and he's been a hands-on healthcare professional in the crisis on the floor with his staff. So he's not, a, he's not an ivory tower executive. He's in there with, in the trenches. He's on the front line. And, and he's going to tell us all about that experience. But I'd like to tell you a little bit about him first. Dr. Nick, I said, is the executive director of Huntington Hospital. Uh, he's been in the medical profession for 30 years. He's been uh, at uh, the Northwell system and Huntington Hospital since 1992. He's held various different executive positions, including the vice chair, of medicine for the entire Northwell Health System. He's been the chief of staff and the director of hospital services at Huntington Hospital. He's elected the governor of the American College of Physicians, the Long Island region. He was awarded a mastership by the ACP and he's been recognized on their honor roll. He's a fellow of the Society of Hospitalist Medicine, a former president of that organization's Long Island chapter. And he's been widely published with over 30 peer reviewed papers uh, that have been published. Uh, he's been an invited panelist on prestigious national organizations, including the American Board of Internal Medicine, the Agency for Healthcare Research and the Quality, and the National Quality Forum. He holds a bachelor's degree from Stony Brook. He's got a medical degree from SUNY Downstate. And he's com he completed his residency at Stony Brook, so he's a Long Island guy, all right? Welcome, Dr. Fitterman. Thank you for taking the time. Thanks, Greg, it's always good to talk to you again. You know, it's, it's Huntington Hospital appears to have been in the eye of the storm in our region in Suffolk County. Um, and I know you've literally been on the floor with your staff, right, and treating the, the patients that were suffering from COVID-19. So, if you could tell us what the reality was during that experience. Sure, uh, first, thanks for that introduction. I hope my mother's listening. <laughs> but, uh, the, so, so it's interesting how this started in the beginning of March, Greg, that um, Huntington was the epicenter of the outbreak in Suffolk County. For the first two to three weeks of the pandemic, we were the epicenter, and that had to do with some hotspots that we recognized in Huntington Station in South Huntington. Um, as a result, we, uh, we had a, tr a very quick escalation in the number of COVID patients that we were caring for here at Huntington Hospital. We um, had surge plans in effect to more than quadruple our ICU capacity, the ability to take care of patients in intensive care units. <clears throat> we converted, we went from 20 to over 70 intensive care unit beds and had plans to go to 120 if needed. We had nurses step up like you can't believe. Our medical staff, our nursing staff, everybody who worked in the hospital marched right in. We did not have people calling out sick. They marched right in and to take care of these, these acutely ill patients. And the nurses had a higher volume of patients and they had higher acuity. So we had patients on our general medical floors that normally we would put in an intensive care unit. Uh, and they were rendering care on the floors and doing a great job. But um, make no mistake about it, it was, um, it was humbling and it was challenging. And you were actually on the floor with staff treating the patients, yes? I did. I, I had to oversee the command center, which was running 24-7. I, I still see patients one week a month. I block out to see patients. So for the first month of the uh, pandemic, I couldn't do that because I was overseeing the command center. Uh, but as the volume started to go down, I was able to put my white coat on and get back up, get back on the floors. I'm sure you were welcome. I'm sure you were welcome. So we heard an awful lot from the beginning of the pandemic in terms of health care. The lack of personal protection equipment. Was that the reality that it was so short? I mean, you've heard conflicting things that people had plenty, they didn't have enough. What was, what was your experience? So our experience was different from other health systems. And we're very fortunate here at Huntington Hospital to be part of the Northwell Health System. And the Northwell System was 
prepared for this. They started planning for this in early January. They revved up their supply chains. And at Huntington and at all Northwell sites, we were never lacking for want of PPE or ventilators. Yeah. That is not, that cannot be said for uh, other health systems, even here on Long Island, where I, I know personally I've spoken to physicians and nurses in the other health systems that were indeed lacking for PPE. Uh, we're worried about supply of ventilators. Mm. So now that the numbers have started to crest a bit, you have enough supply of PPE, but can you handicap the performance that you experience in, during the height of the crisis in your hospital? Just give us a, give us a, a flavor of, you know, did you guys get an A plus or did you get a, an A minus? Where were we in that scope of performance? Yeah, I, I would I would give the team here. And of course, I'm going to be biased, but I'm, I'm I'm also I'm also my own biggest critic, always looking to get better. And I would give the team here an A plus, Greg. They did an unbelievable job. Um, if I walked you through this hospital at the peak of the pandemic on April sixth, we peaked here, where we had quadrupled our ICU census. The number of patients we had on vents were five times the usual number of patients we have on vents. Um, that there was no chaos. There was no craziness. If you walk through the halls of the hospital, you would have thought this was standard operating procedure. Unlike, and just like every other day, with the exception that everyone had masks on and, and, and more PPE than usual. See, that was um, my, next, my next question. What was the burden of the doctors and the nurses in term, as opposed to day-to-day -day operations? How different was it? It was very, it was very different. They, they, had to, they, they had more patients and the patients were of much higher acuity. So what we did is we innovated on the fly. We created staffing pyramids where we leveraged the expertise of a critical care nurse or of a hospitalist or a critical care physician by supplying, by, by supplying them with other healthcare providers who would have otherwise have been inactive during this pandemic. Recall there was no elective surgery going on. So we had surgeons that weren't operating. We had OR nurses and, and ambulatory surgery unit nurses that weren't, weren't working. Right. What we did was we repurposed them to help support the doctors and nurses on the front lines. So where a typical um, doc may have taken care of 15 patients in a day, they now were able to oversee the care of 30. So that, that, uh, that innovation on the fly is one of the reasons I give the team an A+. Plus. Terrific. So um, the burden that they shared amongst themselves with the critically sick people, the number of deaths they experienced, that's a pretty big trauma for anybody. It's not something they experience in their day-to-day. -day. Of course, there's deaths in the medical profession and the healthcare profession, but nothing at this scale. So my concern is that many of them are going to need to have somebody to talk to because it's such an overburdening thing. I mean, you know, thank you, God. I, I survived PTSD, but I know what it's all about. You can't unsee what you've seen. So is there any plans involved to, to help the staff? Yeah, you know, you're spot on, Greg. The amount of death and suffering that staff witnessed here was unlike anything we've seen before. For, for your listeners to know, this is not the flu. This is much more deadly than the flu. And staff here were surrounded by it. And recall, there were no visitation uh, um, uh, rights at this time. By an executive order by our governor, visitors were not allowed, and for good reason. That was to protect our staff, the patients that were here, as well as the public. So very often, we had, we had at, we, at peak, we were doing 50 virtual visits per day where staff would hold an iPad up for the sick patients here to communicate with their loved ones. And many times, that included a final goodbye. So staff were, uh, you know, were really up to their necks in these emotionally saturated visits. And yes, it's taken, it, it takes a toll on you. So we have an employee assistance program on site three days a week. 
We've set up a tranquility tent outside that's been going for a month now where we have music, we have refreshments, and we have people from, from the EAP to come talk to our staff. Um, we have about another half a dozen such programs where staff can seek help either as a group or individually, including a relaxation room. And we even set up, we even converted one of our conference rooms during the peak of the pandemic and used our physical therapists to provide muscle relaxation and massages. Oh, wow, wow, good, that's, that's good. They're gonna need all of that going forward, I think. I think we haven't seen the toll that that's gonna take quite yet, uh, but, but I'm glad you guys are on top of it. Yeah. So. We also, Greg, if I may let you know, we also, um, and this was a system-wide effort, not just localized to Huntington, but we have a hero's bonus for all our frontline staff, which included a monetary uh, reward as well as PTO, paid time off, extra PTO, a week off above and beyond what they're normally entitled to because we want them to be able to go out and recharge, to refresh, to grieve, and to heal. Wow, that's that's wonderful. That's that's a very very thoughtful plan and something I think that they'll all deserve and 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 be grateful for. So you went through the crucible, all right. You you've come out the other side now. What what are the really solid lessons that you learned during this process as the executive running that the hospital? Yeah, we we learned a lot. We we learned uh, there are a lot of things we learned, and I break it up into operationally and clinically. This virus was as humbling as it was challenging to treat. On the clinical side, we learned it does not just affect the lungs, it affects the heart, it affects the kidneys, it affects the nervous system, it causes blood clots. And we've uh, learned a great deal. We here at Northwell are in the epicenter of the epicenter. And uh, we are leading the way. And when I say we, I mean the collective we here, not just Huntington, in terms of research and publication on how to treat the disease. On the operations side here in, in Huntington Hospital, there are a lot of things we learned, a lot of things we did that made us much more efficient. And many of those, those things we're going to continue doing. And it also helped us shake loose a lot of inefficiencies out of necessity. It really accelerated change that we've been trying to accomplish here over the last year and a half. Um, so, you know, that old saying, never let a crisis go unwasted, we, we, we won't. That's not usually the way it's taken, but your, point, right. but your point is well taken. Don't let a good crisis go to waste. Um, but so because of that, do you think that hospital operations in general across the board are going to be changed going forward? Absolutely, but there will, there will never be going back to the way things were. There is now a new normal, just like there was a new normal after 9-11. No one ever heard of, uh, of um, some of the things that we do before 9-11. And uh, things will not be the same after COVID because COVID is not going away. We have created pathways here now that will ensure the safety of anyone who needs to come to the hospital. One of the concerns is there has been an uptick in out of hospital arrests, cardiac arrests. We see people arriving for stroke care beyond the window in which we could treat them effectively because they're afraid to come to the hospital. Somewhere along the line, the message got twisted. The message not to come to the hospital during the pandemic was because we needed all the beds and all the staff to take care of COVID patients. But how it's been interpreted is don't come to the hospital because you might catch COVID. And that's not the case. We have pathways, safe pathways created such that patients that come in electively or for non-COVID related illness will never cross paths with COVID positive patients. And we even have staff separate on COVID units and non-COVID units. So we won't have the same environmental workers or nursing assistants crossing over from one unit to another. That's important information because people were shy of showing up. So yeah. now that things seem to be opening up again, you're able to start doing some elective procedures and so forth. Can you tell us about what the public should know in terms of coming to you? 
Yeah. The public should know that we've created these safe pathways, that they're more likely to catch COVID out in the community than they are here. And we have data to back that up. You know, our nursing assistants, our nurses, our medical staff here, we tested them all. We tested almost all 2,000 employees here with serologic testing to see who made antibodies to COVID, which would mean they had the disease. Because remember, over 80% of patients that get this don't even know they had it or they had something very minor. Yeah. And what we found is the percentage of staff here that have positive antibodies is lower than what's happening in the community, lower. And think about that. They're surrounded. They were surrounded by COVID every day for two straight months. Exactly. You guys were in the crucible and you came out in, in almost like in a better situation than people who weren't. Our, our critical care nurses, Greg, they, they were taking care of the sickest of the sick. The, the critical care units were filled, totally filled with COVID patients. 9% of them have antibodies to COVID. That's compared to 14 to 15% out in the community, 25% out in the city. So that tells us two things. One, PPE works, personal protective equipment. And that two, the pathways we've set up here to protect patients and non-COVID patients and our staff absolutely work. Dr. Neck, I think you get an A plus, quite frankly, because what you guys pulled off was miraculous in, in, in just the operational side, forget about the clinical side, just being able to service that many people and provide care for them. But the fact that your statistics show the job that you did, it, it just warrants praise. And, and, and I hope you take it from whence it came. I'm just a lowly community guy. I'm in your community, <laughs> but I'm so glad you guys are there and I'm so glad you're running the ship. So now, without keeping you here all day long, I know you're a busy guy, but I do have a question that I've been asking all of my guests. In your vision of what's coming, A, when do you see the, company, the country reopening? And B, what do you think that new abnormal is going to look like or when we get some, to someplace that we would think is normal? I think we're seeing the fact that we, the governor gave us permission to start doing elective surgery here is, in Suffolk County is testimony that uh, we're getting a handle on this. We're on the downslope of, the, of this curve that we're flattening. Um, I think as long as the public continues to do what they do, and, and by the way, I have to thank the public. This was not something that we could have treated our way out of without the support of the public. And everyone out there that's wearing a mask that is obeying social distancing, that's why we're succeeding right now, in addition to the healthcare being provided here. But we could not have done it without that support. So as the summer comes, as, as restrictions start to loosen up, if we get too complacent, we will see a surge. It's happened in France, it's happened in China, it's happened in Singapore. And if we get complacent, we will see a bump up and the country will not open up for many more months. So if we continue to obey social distancing, I could see us really being opening up by June, end of June, um, but it'll look different. It'll look different. There'll be social distancing will remain part of that. Um, the new norm will be social distancing and it won't get back to close to what you and I remember as normal until there is herd immunity and effective vaccination. And we're probably six to 12 months away from that. Yeah, I hope the, I hope the uh, ambitious tests that were revealed the other day are successful and we can narrow that timeline a bit to vaccine because I think that's the answer. We have to get that, like you said, herd immunity and vaccine. And then we can go back to our daily routines, what we know is normal, because this is abnormal. This social, we're not, people are supposed to be with people, supposed to be, I'm a gregarious guy, we, we kiss and we hug and everything else, and that is yeah. sorely missed. I haven't had a kiss from one of my kids in <laughs> forever long, it's almost like, forget uh -huh. it. So those are the things that we need to get back to. And I think, quite frankly, you're correct. If we're cautious, if we, do what's smart and we don't throw it under the bus and say, I'm doing this anyway. If we do that united as a community, as a country, we'll get through this. It's going to take time, but we just need to look at where we were before this all started and make that our goal to get back to that. 
in good health and 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 well you, you got to recognize the people that we lost it's just tragic and and the numbers are just scary um but it is what it is and and, and all we can do is pray for those people and their families but going forward i think we need to get together and, and not um, be divisive in our mindsets and these rules came down from from people with good intent whether we agree with them entirely or not we should follow them all right because that's what's going to get us through so i really 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 appreciate your time i want to thank you for your service to huntington and the community and the hospital uh, the fact and your staff and please uh, relay that to the staff uh, will do very much for their service and we thank you for sitting down with us today thank you dr Nick. thank you greg stay safe you too